Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto Stephen's death. And at that time, there was a what? A great persecution. The word great is the word mega. It describes something that is enormous. The word persecution is the Greek word dioko. The word dioko is the old Greek word for a hunt. So a better translation would be there was a great hunt against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And the leadership in Jerusalem literally began to go from house to house to house to house. And they authorized one named Saul of Tarsus to lead the hunt. And the Bible tells us, and they were all scattered abroad. There you have it again. The Greek word diasporia. And at this particular early moment of the church, they were only scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. But later, they were scattered all over the eastern lands of the Roman Empire. Now, when they were in Jerusalem, they were growing stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And we can surmise that the devil may have been a little concerned about this concentration of believers in Jerusalem and may have thought, maybe I need to break them up. Maybe we need to do something to divide them and scatter them and weaken them. But what he didn't realize is he was scattering them like seed all over the eastern lands of the Roman Empire. And everywhere they were scattered, they gave birth to the church into the kingdom of God. And in fact, if they had not been scattered, it may have been that they would have just stayed in the city of Jerusalem. And the attack of the enemy ended up promoting the kingdom of God. It's one of the greatest examples of how everything the devil does backfires and always works in our favor. But the reason that James wrote this book is because he is still in Jerusalem. And every day he goes out to check his mail and his mailbox is just packed with letters that are coming from these Jewish believers that have been scattered all over these lands. They're writing and writing and writing and writing. And the reason they're writing to James is because this is the half-brother of Jesus. Surely he will have answers to our questions. And their primary question is identified in verse 13. So let's go to verse 13. And in fact, if you don't understand verse 13, you won't understand anything in the book of James. So when you come to verse 13, James actually quotes what they're saying to him in their correspondence. He says, let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But when you read this in the Greek text, there's a double negative at the very first of the verse, which means James is literally lifting his verse, his voice, and whatever these believers are saying is so offensive to him. That he says, stop it, stop it now. Let no man say it. Don't you dare say it. I want this to cease right now. Don't you ever say it again. And what were they saying? Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. And the word tempted that is used here describes an event that comes to crush and to decimate. And this word describes what these believers were feeling. They had been scattered. They had lost everything. They were saying, what has happened to our lives? We believed the gospel was good news, and now we've experienced such bad news. How has this happened to us? And they were saying, is God somehow behind this? Has God somehow in his great wisdom and sovereignty allowed all these bad things to come into our life? And James said, don't you dare say that. God is not behind what has happened to you. Don't say it. Don't you ever say it again. And the reason we know that is what they are saying is because of verse 13. Let no man say, stop it now. Don't you ever say it again. When his life is being crushed and destroyed, I'm being tempted of God. Or now we understand the Greek means I'm being crushed and destroyed and notice that little word of, circle that word of in verse 13, of God. Well, in Greek, there are two potential words that could have been used for the word of. This is very important. If he had used the word hupo, H-U-P-O, it would have carried the idea of direct agency. It would have meant they were saying, yes, 
God himself directly caused us to lose everything. God himself, hupo, directly. It came directly from him. He is the one that caused us to become disjointed and to lose our family members and to lose our finances and to lose everything we have. God himself. If they had used the word hupo, but they didn't. Instead, they were using the second word, which is the preposition apo, spelled A-P-O, which means to do something remotely or to do something from a distance. So rather than directly blame God for what they were going through, they instead were saying, well, now we know that God did not directly do these things to us, but God is God and God is sovereign. And if God had wanted to stop these things from happening to us, certainly God could have stopped it. But since God didn't stop it somehow remotely from the distance behind the scenes, oppo, God has allowed all of these crushing decimating events to pass into our lives. No, he didn't directly do it, but he could have stopped it and he didn't. So remotely, you know, God works in strange and mysterious ways and somehow working behind the scenes, oppo, he's allowed these things to happen to us. Well, first of all, God does not work in strange and mysterious ways. And in fact, if you study the Bible, you will find God is very predictable. He's very predictable what he does, what he does not do, how he responds to situations. God is very predictable. But why did they easily gravitate toward this belief? That God somehow in some way remotely behind the scenes allowed this to pass into our lives. It was easy for them to gravitate toward that belief because before they were Christians, they'd been raised as Jews. And if you look at the Old Testament, there really is not a revelation of the devil in the Old Testament. They thought everything came from God. They were blind to the reality of the devil. And in fact, the reality of the devil did not come to the forefront until Jesus came and began to preach. And a light shined on them that sat in darkness. It was Jesus that began to point out the work of the devil. But prior to that, the Jewish people as a whole just believed that God was in control of everything. God permitted everything. And therefore, if a flood came, they thought God sent the flood. That was Old Testament thinking. If a plague came, they thought God permitted the plague. That is Old Testament thinking. Well, now they're New Testament believers, but because they have run into a little trouble, they're gravitating backward to their their old mindset. Now, I understand this because I grew up in the same denomination that Andrew grew up in. And we believe that God sent everything. In fact, if somebody mentioned the devil in our church, we thought that person needed psychiatric treatment. (laughs) This is a nut. They're talking about the devil. We didn't even really believe in the devil. It was a fantasy. That's why when we were kids, on Halloween, we dressed up like witches and monsters and demons and walked the streets. I would never imagine doing that with my children or my grandchildren today. But we were like Old Testament Jews. We just did not have a, re- a revelation that the devil and evil was real. We thought that God was in charge and everything ultimately came from God. And we really saw this especially in what we called Wednesday night prayer meetings. I grew up a Southern Baptist. Denise grew up a Southern Baptist. Did anybody else grow up a Southern Baptist? Here's the way it went Wednesday night prayer meeting, which really was not a prayer meeting. I don't know why we called it that. He would say, does anybody have any prayer requests? And those who had a prayer request would stand up, pray for my Uncle Joe. He is in the hospital dying of terminal cancer. The pastor would say, all right, we're going to pray for your Uncle Joe that he will have the grace 
to accept that cancer and that he will glorify God in his cancer because we believed everything came from God. And I remember as a teenager sitting there thinking, if I ever get sick, I'm not going to ask this church to pray for me. (laughs) We didn't have a clue that sickness was to be resisted. We'd never heard anything like that. We just thought that we were to pray for the grace of God just to accept everything that came down the pike and glorify God in our situation. Though we were New Testament believers, we were very Old Testament Jewish in our mentality. And now these Jews, which James is addressing, they've been walking in the gospel, they've embraced the gospel, but when they've run into a little trouble, now they've said, well, you know, maybe, 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 maybe that old way of thinking was right. Oppo, maybe from a distance, God in somehow, in some way, remotely has allowed all of these devastating events to come into our life for some reason, maybe to change us, to conform us into the image of Jesus. But let me tell you, God does not have to send tragedy to change you into the image of Jesus. And that is not the pattern of God. And that's why James becomes so abrupt at the first of this verse. He literally lifts his voice and says, cut it out. I don't want to hear this anymore. Stop it and stop it now. How dare you say it? That when you're being crushed and decimated, how could you even allege that you're being crushed and decimated by the permissive will of God? Well, of course, Jesus was James' brother. It was Jesus who hung on the cross. It was Jesus who took our judgment. It was Jesus who took our shame. It was Jesus who took our sickness. It was Jesus who took our poverty. Friends, I say that Jesus was like a giant net that stood between us and all of that damnation. It all fell on Jesus, so it would not have to be passed on to us. And for God to now send these things into our life, God would have to say, excuse me, Jesus, I know you died to take all of this, but I've decided I'm going to lay it on my people anyhow. And God would have to walk around the work of the cross in order to allow these things to pass into our lives. And God is not going to do that. And in fact, then he goes on to say, Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. Or now you understand, stop it now, don't say it anymore. When your lives are being crushed, decimated, and destroyed, how dare you say your lives are being crushed and destroyed, even by the remote permissive will of God. And then he goes on to say, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But when you read it in the Greek text, it goes on to say, neither tempts any man with evil. And here we find the wonderful truth that God has no experience with evil. He doesn't respond to evil. He's never touched evil. One time evil tried to come into the presence of God in the form of Lucifer and God cast him out like a bolt of lightning because evil does not exist in the presence of God, which means God doesn't have anything evil, damaging and destruction to give anybody. He doesn't have anything like that. It's not in his nature. He doesn't tempt anybody with these things. It is beyond the realm a possibility. If anybody ever says to you, is there anything God cannot do? The answer is emphatically, yes. He cannot send damaging, evil destruction into people's lives. He is against it. And that is why Jesus absorbed it. So then the question arises, okay, if God doesn't send evil, damaging, hurtful things into our life, even permissively, then what does God send in our life? Well, James is the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, so of course, he's going to give a very good pastoral answer, and we find that in verse 17. Look at verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Every good and perfect gift is from above, and what? 
cometh down from whom the father of lights, what? With whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. That verse is jam-packed with revelation. First of all, it says every. In Greek, the word every describes abundance, every good. The word good, the Greek word agathos, the word agathos describes that which is beneficial, that which always adds to your life. If you experience agathos, it brings you something. It completes you. It is a benefit to you. So the first thing we find is if something comes from above, it's going to bring a benefit into your life. So this is really a very simple test. Let's use cancer as an illustration. Is cancer a benefit? It fails the test. It doesn't come from God because what comes from God always comes with a benefit. And then he adds every good and every perfect gift. And guess what? The word perfect is the word telos, T-E-L-O-S. The word telos describes completing or maturing, which means when God sends something into your life, it never takes away from your life. It adds to your life. It completes your life. It takes your life upward to the next level. And in fact, the word telos, which is used here, is the same word which was used to describe a student who graduated from one class up to the next class, to the next class, to the next class. It pictures upward movement in life, which means if God sends you something, it's going to create upward movement in your life. It will never take away and it will never send you down. I think that's, if we stopped right there, this is important because instantly you're able to determine what comes from God and what does not. If you're experiencing something that is destroying your marriage, fails the test. It's not from God. If you're experiencing something that is taking away from you financially, fails the test. God did not arrange this event because it's taking from you. But when something comes from God, it brings a benefit and puts you on an upward trajectory in life. Every good gift and every perfect completing gift. And now James begins to speak in comparative language. Is from above as opposed to what comes from below. And then he adds this statement. And cometh down. Cometh down. Everybody say cometh down. Oh my goodness. This is the Greek word katabino. The word kata means down, but it carries the idea of something coming down so hard it is dominating, it is conquering, it is subjugating. So whatever is coming down, it's coming down really, really hard. The second part of the word is the word bino, which means to step. But these two words used together were the very words used to describe a downpour. A downpour. Now, I don't know if you have real downpours in the state of Colorado, do you? Florida has it. Oklahoma for sure has it. How many of you have been in a real downpour? I'm talking about a downpour. If you're driving the car, you cannot see the taillights of the car in front of you. You can't see the lines on the road. In fact, you're just paralyzed by it because it is so dominating. It is so subjugating. You just have to pull over and park because you're under this downpour that is coming from above. So now, not only does James say, God gives things that are beneficial, completing, maturing, and will put you on an upward trajectory in life. This is what comes from above as opposed to what comes from below. And by the way, God sends so many good and perfecting gifts into our life that it's like a heavenly downpour that is just pouring around us all the time. So somebody says, all right. If these good and perfect gifts are just pouring all around me, why am I not once in a while hit by one of them? It's a very good question. It's a very good question. We're told in Hebrews chapter 2 that we need to give more earnest heed to the things we've heard lest at any time we should let them slip us by. 
Now we have the picture of God trying to find somebody to play catch. And God is sending things our way, good and perfect gifts. He's throwing them. He's hurling them in our way. But most people have got their head down. They're in the gutter. They're not thinking right. They're not using their faith. So the downpour, the gifts are just passing them by. God is looking for somebody who will say, you know what? I'll take that one and I'll take that one and I'll take that one and I'll take that one. I really believe this. My father said to me, Rick, I've never seen anybody like you. He said, you just think a thought, and it seems like something good happens to you. I said, Daddy, that's the world I live in. He said, how does that happen? I said, Daddy, you receive what you believe. And I believe God is raining his goodness into my life. And God's plan is not that I just be rained on, but kata. That preposition meaning God wants to dominate me. He wants to conquer me. He wants to subjugate me with good and precious gifts. And not just me, everyone that is in covenant with him. But then the verse goes on to say, and cometh down from the father of whom? Lights as opposed to what comes from the father of darkness. And then he adds, with whom, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. With whom in Greek are two words, par un. The word par is a form of the word para, which means alongside. The word un means him or, but when you put the two words together, it pictures us crawling right up alongside of God, para. In fact, the preposition para is also where you get the word parasite. Well, you can't be much closer than a parasite. So here it shows is cleaving to the side of God. And James says, hey, listen, if you don't believe what I'm saying, you just go draw near to God. You cleave to his side, look into his face by yourself. And when you get right next to him, you will see there's no evil in him. He's the giver of good and perfect gifts. And when you get right alongside of him on this question of what he gives and what he never gives there's no variableness neither shadow of turning what does that mean well the words shadow of turning is borrowed from a Roman sundial How many of you know what a Roman sundial is? You know, a Roman sundial has all of its numbers. It's got a piece of metal or a stick. And the shadow is constantly moving based on the rotation of the earth. So the shadow's never in the same place at one time. The shadow is in constant movement. One translation says this. God is not like one who is shifting shadows. But it really means on the issue of what God gives and what God never gives, the shadow never moves. There's no variableness. There's neither shadow of turning. It is fixed. God does not variate. He doesn't move on this question, which means you don't need to waste your time praying if something evil was sent from God. Because on this issue, God never variates. He never budges. It never changes. Which means you always know how you need to pray. And you always know what you need to resist. And you always now know what you need to receive. That's how important this is. It draws a line in the sand and gives you clarity for the rest of your life. And let's just look at one more thing. I'm going to move real quick. Look at the next verse. Of his own will. Is that the next verse? Of his own will begat he us to be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Of his own will, in Greek is the word bulomai. The word bulomai means I counsel. So it literally means God had a counseling session. Well, who was going to counsel God? God, he had a meeting with himself. And God by himself made a decision of his own will, 
of his own bulomai, he made his own decision. Of his own will begat he us. Begat he is a Greek word which describes indeed a birth, but it's an abnormal kind of a birth. It's not a natural kind of a birth. Of his own will begat he us differently with the word of truth. What word of truth are we talking about? The truth that we just read in verse 17, that he's the giver of good and perfect gifts, that his will is to dominate us with his goodness. Of his own will, just because he decided to do it, he chose to bring forth a different kind of people who would be dominated by his goodness. The first fruits of a brand new species people who've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness and who now live in the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of his dear son, where darkness is not supposed to touch them. And my friends, if something dark passes that line into your life, this means you are to resist it and push it back and never to say, I wonder if God somehow in his permissive will allowed that devil to come into my life. And this is so ludicrous in the mind of James. He says, just stop it, stop it now. Don't you ever say these things to me again. How dare you say when your life is being crushed and destroyed that you're being crushed and destroyed by the remote, permissive, sovereign will of God. God doesn't have anything evil. He can't give you anything evil. And if you want to know what he does give, every good and perfect gift is from above. And God is pouring it on you. And on this question, God never moves. 